of we know that authentic assessments is like a thing that um, a thing that um, we've talked about in the online learning space, and now we have all of this AI integration. So where do you see the the intersection of um, AI and designing authentic assessments, or AI in int integrating AI? And I don't I don't want to like restrict how you think about that, but broadly, where do you see that intersection um, in your work? right now or moving forward go <laughs> can i can i pull this a little bit 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 back to what you were just saying and then sort of maybe hopefully combine the two in a way i don't know we'll see if i get there um i think ai is such a great space to be thinking about the larger why why we are doing a thing rather than the how we are doing a thing right so again Citation is such an, a, a great example here. The why of we're citing is because we want someone to be able to follow the work and follow the through line. The how we're doing it, to be honest, is a pretty outdated system at this point. Like when things are online, there's no reason for stuff to not just be a hyperlink. It is absolutely insane. Uh, and at some point I have to imagine that things will catch up to that and we will just hyperlink stuff. Like, I don't know what we would do on paper, but that's not where the world is going. So, and I think that being aware of those types of innovations is really where we can pull in things like AI and authentic assessment. Um, it is worthless to me when I'm teaching writing to teach, to tell my students that they have to memorize MLA, APA, whatever, not just because they're going to have to do a bunch of different ones, but also because there are AI tools that do that for them. I can tell them, use this tool, save yourself 50, 50 hours of work, memorizing what a container is and what work would go, use this thing and then check it. And then use your critical brain to check it, which is really where I think the authentic assessment part of using AI and doing these types of things and building AI Oh, I hate the way that people put this. People tend to say like AI proof as if authentic assessments and AI can't coexist. And I hate that. And I was about to say it. And I'm like, no, that's not right. Um, authentic AI assessments. I think you can build those into your authentic assessments if you are honest with your students, again, about your use, about their use, and about how you see co-creation. If you ask them, what could you co-create? What kind of AI tool? would you make to innovate plumbing, advertising, writing? What would you do? Go find a thing, write a thing with it, give it my, tell it to take your meeting notes, bring me your work, show me your process. And if it's the thing that is then showing me your process, show me your process of using it to show me your process. Whatever that is, you can make that something that is an authentic assessment that does tie in everything we've been talking about, like the difference between critical thinking and job skills. That's all of the above. That's design how you would use this and then learn to use this and then present this to me. And it's saying, do it for something that matters to you. If you're an adult learner coming back to this space, how would you use this in your career? If you are someone who is in a major how, how could you see this being used in your major? And if you don't know, go talk to someone, ask AI. Yeah. Ask AI what they would see, ask AI what it would innovate and then work off of that. Is that a good innovation? Is that a bad innovation? And I think we have a whole generation of students, the younger students um, who are, I don't even want to say technology savvy because I do think some of them lack some fundamental technology skills because they weren't taught those in terms of practical life. Um, they are, if I want to put it, they are used to disrupt culture. Mm. That is a thing that they are very used to, right? They are used to Airbnb, Uber, anything that's like disrupt culture. And to some degree, AI is a disruptor. It's disrupt culture that's accessible to everybody rather than I'm going to disrupt the cab industry or Frank's hot dog stand. It's I'm going to disrupt, I can disrupt on a small scale. 
And I think a lot of our students are used to that idea of a disruptor. So how do you use it to disrupt? What does it mean to disrupt academia? What does it mean to disrupt this assignment? And the more that we can frame it, <laughs> excuse me, in ways that our students will understand and that speak to their lives, great. I also think we can start with really simple things like icebreakery type things. Even if we're not using AI in our classroom, why not have an icebreaker that's like either like, how do you use AI? Do you use it? And if not, why not? Or like, what would an AI say, given your social profiles, what would an AI say about you? Think like the AI and then go pull an AI and see what it actually says when you put in that information. Things like that, that we can easily pull in that show them that we are understanding that this is technology that is out there, that is in the ether, even if we're not going to be actively using it like frank said if it if it's not useful for me i don't want to think about it maybe it's not useful for, the, for that class but it's useful for their life again that marriage of practical life and high thought right and if that's what we're doing here there's always ways to do that and to keep your students centered in that i love the reflection piece of that so for me, authentic assessment always goes back to the reflection piece. So am I reflecting about how my own experiences relate to what I'm learning? Am I reflecting on the process that I went through to produce the product that I needed for my course? And to me, that's that's that key component is the reflection piece. So it's it's approaching the use of AI in the classroom from a space of you're not just giving them the tool to give them the tool. You're giving them the tool to maybe produce a product, but maybe you're challenging them to think about how this product may better or make their life more crazy than they want it to be. And so it's that discovery process and then that critical reflection piece for me that wins. I think that um, I... I'm excited about the opportunities of what AI can do to help us as faculty to create more authentic assessments. Um, we should be harnessing the uses of AI. I know um, I was trying to update a rubric for what is something that's going to be used across our program. And um, our accrediting body is very particular about our rubrics and how they're worded. And I was able to, you know, use chat GPT and prompt engineer it so that I got some pretty good rubric criteria out of it. And I could then, you know, use that to actually grade my authentic assessments, my lesson plan artifacts that my, my students are turning in. And this is going to be used multiple times throughout the program. Um, so I was very excited that you know it took some finessing but i was able to get what i needed out of it to better support my ability to create authentic assessments and to assess them on a more level playing field so i'm excited about that so i'm gonna do something i never do which is be provocative um and i'm gonna say that from hearing all of you you've, you've gotten you've, you've you've sparked some thoughts about my thinking about authentic assessments, because I think I used to think about it in terms of the format of the assessment. Um, you know, um, a multiple choice exam versus uh, a portfolio or something like that. But as we've been talking about this, and I think maybe the segue, uh, and Elizabeth pointed this out, the segue kind of helped get us here, the discussion about skills and how skills become obsolete, they do. The classic one is that in higher ed, we talk, it's, it's always the, the calculator. This, this metaphor or this analogy has come up a lot, that AI is basically a word calculator. It, it is to the liberal arts what the calculator was to math and science, right? So um, it was really important for math and science students to be able to calculate in their minds complex equations. That was a very important skill because you could not do math and science without that skill. The calculator comes along, that whole skill set is obsolete now. Great if you can do it, wonderful, but not necessary anymore. And that was, you know, sort of the, the cut. 
And so they had to shift to, well, what is important for them? They need to be able to evaluate, make sure what they inputted and the functions they used gave them the correct answer. How can they evaluate that they, you still have to input data in the calculator, right? It doesn't do it itself. So some people say, well, they shifted to higher order skills, right? They went up a level or two on Bloom's taxonomy. Like we have these ways of, of measuring and evaluating. And, and we've had conversations like that in my office about, you know, chat GPT, like, okay, it can write for you, but how do you know that what it wrote is, is good? How do you know that? How do you evaluate that, right? And so then it, A, becomes about prompting it, and B, it becomes about evaluating what comes out, you know, and then how you use it and so on. So we're, you're, you're having to be more analytical, more evaluative, more creative. Um, so I think the, 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 the authentic assessments conversation to me is being prompted by the fact that technology is always a disruptor. Let's face it, it always is like the first person who ever invented the blackboard seriously disrupted, you know, uh, oral lecturing under a tree, right? <laughs> like, oh man, I really loved giving my lectures, you know, in the amphitheater. What the heck? Now I have to be in a classroom with a blackboard? That sucks. Um, so technology is always a disruptor. AI is a disruptor like any other technology. What it does is make certain skill sets obsolete or not as marketable, let's say, uh, not as necessary. And so we have to shift. We have to pivot to accommodate this new technology that's in our environment. And that requires us then to shift the focus of our assessments to other skill sets. We're teach we're evaluating them. And then, so then the format of the assessment changes too. Right, it's now no longer write me a ten-page research paper, because one day these AI bots are going to be able to write pretty good ten-page research papers with full citations in any style you want: APA, MLA, Chicago, whatever you know. Um, and like somebody said, you know, I don't teach them how to do memorize the APA style anymore because there are websites that where you could just put in the information, turns it out. Now you have to be able to evaluate, make sure it did it well. Um, but that's a different skill set. So I think um, I think so it's a matter then of us identifying what are the new skills in our, each of our disciplines that we need to be evaluating. Because from there, once we identify those skills or competencies, whatever you want to call them, then we'll know, we'll be able to draw a line from there to the correct assessment. I also think that you talked about the calculator and I think, you know, what did the calculator allow folks who use calculators all the time to do is to, to work faster and to do more in a shorter amount of time. And I, you know, what does click and go plumbing allow a plumber to do? It allows them to do more because it doesn't take them as long because they're not having to do all like, of those. Go to the things. next job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can go. And so you can, you could, your turnover rate is what does uh, an assignment that um, I'm probably going to have my students do for my class in the fall, which is communication training, assessment and development. That class has evolved over the years from the classic like consultant go in spend all this time gathering all this data in person calling people like a lot of that now technology allows them to get a lot of that information without ever having to go to the organization anymore so it's like what do you do but one of the things that I am going to have them do because an, an end product of that class is to look at the um, organizations like mission statements and all of those sort of um, uh, documents and evaluate them to see if they need to be reworked and aligned to where that organization is now. Because as you know, a lot of people don't update those things and their organization's purpose and mission may have slightly shifted, and, but the the documents that are sort of governing in particularly the culture of the organization have not. Google had this issue, right? Like they were trying to like change their culture, but like the documents weren't exactly in line with the philosophies that they were espousing until a lot of people quit. Um, so I'm going to have my students 
have AI, some form of AI, generate several um, organizational like mission statements and things like that um, to evaluate, right? Like, so the skill is not the creation of the mission statements, which is what in the past it would have been write a new mission statement. No, no, no. Let chat GBT or whatever you want to use, Bard, Bing, I don't really care. We'll create like 10. Okay, but now I want you to go in and I want you for each one, tell me why it isn't or isn't going to work. Also, I want to know your prompts. Bring, give me your whole history. What did you initially ask it? What did you ask it? And what I plan to do as feedback is say, okay, you started with the wrong ask. That was always going to give you this nonsense, which I'm glad that you were able to identify that this was completely not feasible for you to go walk into this organization and be like, here, you should use this information now. Um, and I'm also going to give them constraints. You cannot, um, you cannot violate the organization's privacy. You can only use publicly accessible information. Anything that is proprietary, you don't have permission to use, you cannot put into this open system. Why? Because you might be violating IP issues. What can you do? How can you use open? And then I'm also going to have the conversation that in some places that you work, especially if they're Fortune 500, they probably are going to have their own proprietary AI systems that you will be allowed. So we're going to talk up, we are going to talk about privacy and data in the context of the thing that they're doing while also using the thing that could potentially be violating said privacy and data, right? And so my hope is that when they walk away, whether they use chat GPT or Bard and Bing, they've understand, they've learned the value of inputs and outputs. They've learned the value of thinking critically um, about data and privacy. They've learned um, how to evaluate what is an effective mission statement versus what is my favorite saying, sounds great, signifies nothing, right? Like these are great words, and they, but it actually does nothing towards the goal and the purpose and the mission of, of what the organizational leaders want you to do. And so a lot of those soft skills or whatever we want to call them are embedded in that activity that is driven by actual hard skills, but that then hopefully prepares them that no matter where they land, they're going to be able to extract the thing that they need um, from that experience to be successful moving on. But also understanding that they would never be able to write 10 versions of a mission statement in an eight-week online asynchronous class without the help of technology. But they could go into a job where the CEO or the VP or the president says, I want 10 versions of the thing that I'm asking you. And if they don't know if they think that the only way they do this is to stay up all night and try to crank out 10 versions of a mission statement or 10 versions of key, key priorities or 10 versions of the strategic plan, because the boss knows who is paid an insane amount of money to make a small number of high quality decisions. That's literally that person's job. If they know, oh, yes, there are ways for me to have multiple versions of a thing to look at so that it takes me the least amount of time to make this ultimate decision. But the expectation is not for the person in charge to actually produce all that. The expectation is for the worker to do that. And I mean, and I hope we all get to the point where we all can have jobs where we're paid handsomely to make a small number of high impact decisions. But the way that work and labor works, especially in our country, that would be a complete upset <laughs> of, of, of structure. And we're not there yet. And perhaps this is the disruption that is that we're moving to. But in the meanwhile, it puts the pressure on the folks who aren't on the hook to make a small number of high impact decisions to produce more. And we have to take that into account. Now it's not just produce one 30 page paper now, I mean, if you think about it, even from a higher ed standpoint, the production expectation of research faculty has drastically increased from 20 years ago, where you could write a book and maybe publish like five seminal papers and you were done. You never had to write again for your career. Now you have people coming out of doctoral programs who have written like 17 high impact articles. They're working on their second solo authored book the production expectations across industry have changed 
because of technology, the rate at which you're supposed to be able to create and design classes, the rate at which you're supposed to be able to churn out learning materials and resources, all of that is increased because the expectation, the assumption is because we have the technology to do that, everyone has access to do that. And so the, the needle again has moved. I do think we have some responsibility to our students to acknowledge that this is the world. I mean, I think about social media influencers. Um, you know, you used to be able to, you know, put out like one video a week. Now they talk about they are banking hours of content because they have to be online and present in order to get paid. The job that was just like, hey, I just pick up my phone and make a couple of videos and I make a million. Like I call it the, um, I don't know if I have kids. So there's this kid on YouTube, Ryan, who we essentially saw him grow up and he like started making these videos, unboxing toys, made a millions of dollars. And you can see the evolution of the expectation of the content that had to be produced for him to be able to continue to get those brand endorsements. It went from these very like low budget, like clearly filmed on a device like the audios but the you know kids love to see the kid open the thing to now it is highly produced you know that they're like banking content all the time like the production um expectations of that just dramatically increased as it oh became God. more profitable which is a thing production profitability both of those things are going to go up so you are not going to be able to do things by hand you're not going to be able to like do things the way that we were taught to do them or the way that we that a lot of us know how to do them it's just not feasible there are not enough hours in the day and from a business standpoint why would i pay somebody if my job is to only have to as the boss is to be able to think if i'm essentially paid to think why would i pay someone else to think when i could pay them to produce and I would love that we all be thinkers. I think that's why open education and just open movements are so radically important in sort of keeping that balance in check. But Frank, you said something way on our first call, like we have to think about students not as- Producers. Oh, that, yes, as, but as, as managers. Uh, and, managers and, and, yeah. and, you know, and that is, that is disruptive thought <laughs> for a lot of reasons, <laughs> but um, it is disruptive, particularly in how we think about the thing that we are assessing and the thing that they should be taking away from what we do in our classes. I don't have an answer, but like, I just really, the whole like idea, I think there is a through line in what we were saying about being able to think, the, the, um, the comment Meredith made about you know, if you go to school and you are only thinking about thinking, you're not thinking about thinking to have a career. I think that tracks in the people who are able to attend those schools and the jobs that they end up with are actually jobs where they are paid and hired to think mm -hmm. versus the people who maybe that is not their motive and where they track in their what they do when they leave us in our institutions, yeah, oftentimes they end up in places that that don't necessarily pay them to think, but because they can think, they can navigate the changes and the shifts, which is how I see myself. I'm not necessarily paid to think, I'm paid to teach. <laughs> and um, And so, but I like to think, so I force thinking into the thing that I do and I create space for that. And that's created opportunity for me um, that not necessarily has translated financially all of the time, but I do think it has translated. And I hope at the end of the day, it's translated into impact, which hmm. is meaningful. So which drives me to continue to want to think and force myself to have time to think, even if that's the thing that I'm not paid to do, because thinking brought me to this conversation, right? Like thinking has brought a lot of opportunity um, and has allowed me to navigate the shifts in higher ed, I think in a different way than some other folks. So that was, I don't know, anything else on? Yes, Katie. I have a couple things. Um, I have a couple things too. Okay. I'm going to be quick, Meredith, I promise. All right. So one is 
I love the idea of um, integrating the use of AI into creating a work product that your students eventually will likely be asked to do. Um, particularly, I love the idea of not only having them bring to you the products that were produced, but the prompts that produce the product, because there's such a learning opportunity, I think, in failure. And so when something doesn't go as expected, going back and dissecting what, where did it go wrong? What parts were the good parts and what part needs to be tweaked or changed to give you a result that you want better? So like, love that. Um, secondly, I thought it was interesting how you um, are talking to your students about privacy and what they're putting into AI. And that is such a hotbed topic that um, I hope we'll explore a little bit further in this conversation in just a little bit. Um, I recently read that Adobe, um, along with like Amazon and Google, they've all um, banned the use of generative AI that's outside of their company's product line. And it's because they don't want their industry ideas, secrets, becoming part of this greater knowledge base. 